All right. If you're a filmmaker, if you're an actor, if you're a producer, if you're creating content in this industry, let me pose the question to you two. How bad would you like your work to be on Kevin Hart's Laugh Out Loud Network? I'd be begging. I'd be begging for it to please, you know, be somewhere near them, right? That's actually of pinnacle importance to me as a you know creative person to get in front of Kevin Hart's uh, production company. Well, welcome back, everybody, to Surviving Hollywood Podcast. My name's Austin. My name's Aaron. I'm Johnny. And we just sat down with a great guest, Candice Wilson-Cherry, who is currently the head of development and production at Kevin Hart's LOL. Huge uh, comedy content network. Used to be... Cherry Wilson, Candace Wilson Cherry used to be uh, the VP of Acquisitions and Development at Lionsgate, Code Black, and we learned a lot from her. What did you guys think of the episode? I mean, I just like what I thought was cool is kind of her sharing her story growing up in the East Coast and coming to LA and then slowly working in music and then eventually working on all these sets and then getting to work at, you know, Laugh Out Loud is pretty wild. You know what I mean? Um, but I think it's just kind of a testament is like, there's not really one way to get to your goal. There's just different paths. And she found a different path and she worked really hard and was super successful. I think the people who will get the most value in this is, um, you know, young women or, or people of color who want to, who are, you know, creative people in the industry, but just generally all creative people in the industry. But that's, you know, was her point of view. It was just really cool. Um, you know, listening to her talk about coming up in the business, right? True. And just from a POV perspective, obviously we're all filmmakers, produce our own stuff. So a lot of our questions were tailored to, all right, when you're finding material, when you're developing these projects, how do you go about sourcing from these film festivals? And how do you go about finding content on YouTube? So we asked the tough questions from a filmmaker's point of view. I think you guys will really enjoy it. I'm a survivor. I'm a survivor. Are you in LA, by the way? I'm in LA. Okay. Um, it's so crazy. Like we've all been working from home, like everyone else. Um, it's been insanely busy, which is a good problem to have. Um, we produced probably, I'm sure we'll cover this too in a little bit, but we've probably done like seven or eight productions during COVID. So that's been like wild, you know, like at this point we have it kind of down pat. The beginning was a little tricky, but you know, yeah. like the nights leading up to it, you're like, okay, wait, is everyone gonna survive? You know, it's a little tricky because we didn't know what was going on at the beginning, right? So that actually encouraged us to like go even beyond, like even go above and beyond the standards to make sure everyone was safe and comfortable and the whole bit. I mean, we've been, you know, been trucking along. So we're in prep right now. We start another production in two weeks. So it's pretty, pretty busy. Yeah, that's, that's definitely a lot. When did you guys start shooting again? July of last okay. year. Yeah, so that was sort of in the thick of it when we were like, you know, when everyone was just trying to sort it out. Um, but it was small. It was a small production. It was just like a one day shoot. We did a lot of like small, like one or two day shoots. We kept it really limited at the beginning. And then, um, you know, now we're ramping back up to this one. This one will be a two week shoot. That'll be the biggest one we've done so far. Um, but yeah. That'll yeah. Be cool. The, the, co the whole COVID thing, it's so difficult now being on set. Um, yeah. Actors, crew, everybody. It's just sort of like this weird thing of like, don't get too close to me. Yeah. Uh, you sit over there. I'll sit over here. Um, and uh, wait, and uh, just one, one random question. Are we, yeah. I see that Kia Sia true luck is in the waiting room are we having both you guys on today i just want to be sure i think he is from lol's pr team okay so she's she, i just want to be sure that everybody's here that's supposed to be yeah i think i think she they said that she was going to be joining i don't know if she'll be i think could, i don't know if her camera will be on or how that works but you could let her in and then turn off her camera all right i'm just making sure i just admitted her all right cool so is uh Kevin Hart, because um, some of the stuff you produce, he's not an actor in, right? Is he? But is he involved with everything that's that's being produced? Not everything. So he's essentially he's our chairman. You know, he's our chairman, and obviously, like we have our Kevin Hart leading vehicles. Like there's those, 
there's even a few that he EPs, but no, you know, it's Laugh Out Loud's a standalone comedy, you know, comedy brand. So he's not involved in every single production, but you know, the man, it's all with the same tone, you know, it's all, it's all in the same vein of, yeah. you know, projects that Kevin would bless. So to sort of kind of backtracks, I know we're definitely going to get into, you know, Laugh Out Loud and, and all that stuff. Um, I'd actually kind of love to hear, you know, how you got started and how you actually ended up working in this industry for one yeah. um, and got to where you are now. Yeah, you know, it's not a traditional route. It's not, sort of, especially, especially being that I, you know, worked in film, it's not a traditional route to that. I actually started in music. I started in songwriting um, from the East Coast, started in songwriting. I was writing and doing vocal arrangements while I was still in college. I went to Temple University in Philly. What type of songs? Who are your influences? Oh my gosh. Um, I listen to literally everything. So while my family's from Jamaica, my mom's from Jamaica. And then nice. my dad's like a white guy from Long Island. So it was like a combination of like Billy Joel meets, you know, Bob Marley meets R&B, you know, you just awesome. it's for the range. Um, then I was also studying like classical music, but I was, you know, growing up in New York. So New York and New Jersey. So you're listening to hip hop, R&B. Minnie Ripperton was like one of my favorite singers of all time. A lot of old stuff, all about the classics. Um, so started in songwriting and that's actually what eventually led me to coming to Los Angeles. I was songwriting and always working in film at the same time, but more so like helping out friends with productions. Are you also a singer as well or just a songwriting? Yes, I was a singer, but okay. it was always like songwriting was always my primary focus and vocal okay. arranging. Like that's where I had a lot of fun. Um, and that's honestly, let, let's be real. I was a better writer than I was a singer. I was a good singer, but I wasn't yeah. a great singer. Otherwise I probably would be having a different interview with you. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about the new single. What's going on? Right, right, right. <laughs> well, I, was a good, I was a good writer and I worked on really great teams, you know, like Grammy award winning teams. And, and that led me to LA. And I always loved storytelling. Like, and, and it translated, you know, it translated. I love projects from start to finish. And um, because of that, even in my downtime from working, I'd be working with my friends on their productions. So sometimes I was the gaffer, sometimes I was, you know, the script supervisor, you know, you're doing, you know how it goes when you're working on indie projects, yeah. you're, you're literally everything, right? You have five jobs. Yeah. You have five jobs and, and, and no budget exactly. <laughs> or, or sometimes a small budget, right? So without, it's so funny when you look back on your journey up until this point, you realize how it was all sort of preparing you for where you are today mm. and um but at the time it was just fun it was just like especially when i got to la it was finding like-minded creative people who if there wasn't you know if there wasn't an outlet they were going to make an outlet like they were going to create a path where there was no path and i think that was just helping me to sharpen the tools sharpen the tools to when the opportunity yeah. started to present themselves um yeah so that that sort of was like the the lead into the lead into it. So, yeah. uh, so how did you sort of make that transition? Because obviously, you know, you don't start doing five jobs like gaffing, crafty on set, and then now you're the head of development. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, Never what, crafty. I'm not a good cook. I'm not. Right. <laughs> I, would, I wouldn't put me in charge of the food <laughs> at all in any circumstance. <laughs> Heaven for a party. Um, yeah, yeah. No. So when I so the, the, the transition came actually, music actually sort of helped with the transition. I was writing for an artist who was managed by a, a bunch of folks. She had a really you know powerful writing team and I was getting a bunch of placements on TV shows and movies and like, like things like that. And um, one of her managers was actually doing business with Jeff Clanagan and he needed someone to help assist him on a project that he was doing with Jeff Clanagan. Mm. So when that project was coming to an end, that allowed me to sort of meet Jeff and the whole bit. When that project was coming to an end, I just basically was like, you know, I loved working with you. If any other opportunities present themselves, you know, I'd love to be kept in mind. And that's one thing I love to talk about too, is like relationships. Like, right. Like, even if it's not the right fit for you, that particular situation, you just, you treat everything like, you know, as you guys know, it's a small town, small business, whether you're in New York or LA, you know, um, a lot of the relationships you have, that's valuable. You know, that's your net, that becomes your network. And um, long story short, 
started working with Jeff and his partner at the time. Now, um, Jeff is uh, from Deaf Comedy Jam. He's the CEO, right, of uh, yeah, Sorry, I'll give, I'll, I'll give more context. Yeah, Jeff yeah. Clinton again. So he's the CEO of Laugh Out Loud. Yeah. Um, he was also the CEO and founder of uh, Code Black, which is at that time at where- Lionsgate. He was, at Lionsgate. Yeah, and this is actually right before the Lionsgate situation when I met him, just from a timeline standpoint. So this is when they were with Universal Vivendi and um, and mostly doing distribution, but also doing production for all like the comedy shows. So they were, they were doing um, Kevin Hart's Laugh at My Pain at that time, right? That's around the time I met him now. So I guess it's like 2011. Okay. And um, I started doing, helping with like tour coordination. So it was my job to get all of the props, like meaning like the DJ booth and like the signage from city to city on like a 14 city tour, right? And keep them under budget. So this was like the first gig they gave me. It was like basically like a, a you know consulting gig. It was like, don't go over budget, don't lose the stuff, right? So I'm like dealing with like trucking companies, unions, like trying to get stuff in and out. Keep in mind, I'm learning the business. So I'd be up at like, yeah. 11, the shows don't end till like 11 o'clock midnight, you know, learning the logistics and all that. Um, did a good job kept them under budget. <laughs> and then when they were going to Lionsgate, when that was announced once again, I was like, hey, they were interviewing people. I'm like, I'd like to be considered. So that's also another theme is just really like putting it out there, you know? Yeah. It's like putting yourself out there, setting yourself up for success, taking a chance on yourself, you know? And then I worked my way up the ladder at Lionsgate. At Lionsgate. From so, assistant so, to VP what, by the time what I left. What did That's you do amazing. to put yourself out there? Like what, uh, to you know, to help get that job? You said what made me or what? Or like what, what did you do to put yourself out there? And uh, yeah. I guess like, you know, things for audience at home thinking about how they want a job like that. Like what kind of things can they do? Yeah, and then the funny thing is I remember being in the office. Like I was in the, off the production office at the time and they were having people come in to interview and I had seen someone's resume that was coming in because it was like, you know, they were doing it at the same time. And it was like tons of like NBC, this and that, worked at this agency. Now, obviously because I had come from music, I didn't have that same background. And that could be really intimidating for someone who's a, you know, making a transition from one industry to another, B, maybe someone who hasn't had the same opportunities. Because as you know, internships now, that especially now that they're paid, are a lot harder to come by. So a lot of companies don't have as many interns. Um, so long story short, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know at the time what made me do it. Honestly, I think it was just like, I really believed in my ability to learn and I was committed and focused on like, if I don't know it, I can learn it. You know, I, I, can, I can figure it out. And that really was even when I got the job and I was at Lionsgate, that's actually what drove me. Like when I started talking to like other assistants and realizing like they had kind of been in this pipeline, like from when they were in college, like they either knew someone, had a family member, they took a class and keep in mind, I'm from the East coast. So I, that makes it a little bit harder, you know, when you're getting into it, whereas like folks are, you know, if you're at UCLA or USC, you're already building those relationships. Yeah. You have like speakers coming into your class and you're getting opportunities to meet people. I don't think I knew anyone in film when I was on the East mm. Coast or TV really. Like I knew some people that were doing things, but like, I don't know if I really knew folks that were really like green lighting anything or, you know, at that level. Um, so it really like encouraged me to learn more. So I was the first one in the office. I was the last one to leave, you know? And when I tell you that was valuable, like if I'm, so if we started at nine, I'd be there by like seven. I'd be eating my breakfast at my wow. dad. I'd be reading every trade. I'd be on social media. So I knew it was hot in the streets, <laughs> was, mm. which also, by the way, translates to what I do now. It's like keeping your finger on the pulse. Like you have to know. You have to know what's in, what's, yeah, exactly. Yeah, what's going to happen. You know what's in. You have to understand sensibility. You have to read the room, understand culture. Like those are big things. Um, you know, learning who's who in the industry from the trades. And in the process, because I would get to work so early, I would actually meet a lot of the C-suite at Lionsgate because <laughs> those guys get in really early. Nice. Um, so, and they would always be like, what are you doing here? Like, <laughs> so early. And I'm like, oh, you know, I like to get in early and just eat and get, I like to see the day coming versus like catching up. 
Yeah. I started taking classes at UCLA as extension, you know. Okay, extension program, yeah. Yeah, and I already had my bachelor's from Temple. Um, but I wanted to really get specific. And because I was already around the conversations, I wanted to understand thoroughly, like what was going on? What was acquisitions? Like, what did that right. mean? What did that entail? What is, what is development, all that stuff? Yeah, like what is did, it? Did you study music in college at Temple? My minor, music composition. Okay. So reading and writing music. Um, and so, did that, so that really helped you with this job? It helped me. Yeah. And once again, it goes back to those relationships. Like to this day, I still have really strong relationships in music. I, can, I count them as some of my really good friends. Um, and I can call on them if like, you know, we're working on something and I, I need to be pointed in a direction or something along those lines. I can reach out to them. But yeah, like you just have to kind of, you have to bet on yourself, go above and beyond. If you don't know it, learn it, you know, um, those are all super important you have to be thorough in to get to move quickly because i guess in six and a half years i went from an executive assistant to a vice president that's huge it's a pretty short time span and um but i think it comes down to like never having the attitude of like that's not my job like that's not my responsibility um that's not the attitude i feel like will get you there you know you almost have to just be flexible um but also be focused on what you want and, and then also once you're focused on what you want, figure out what it is that you need to do to sharpen your tools so that you're prepared for those opportunities, you know, like to continue to grow, learn marketing. I'm not a, a marketing executive, but I've, you know, I use marketing skill sets to make decisions on what type of projects that we should pursue, you know, um, all those different pieces all help, you know, they all help to thrive. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to, to kind of touch on, um you working at Lionsgate um, at Code Black. So you were, you were working in uh, development and acquisitions, right? So maybe for the audience that may not understand entirely what that means, can you kind of break that down? Um, and also they mostly focus on African-American films, right? Correct. So yeah. were you kind of in charge of l constantly looking for that next thing? Yeah. Maybe kind of talk about, about what you were doing there. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay, so development, development means it's the, it's, the, it's the phase before you go into production on a project, right? It's the, pro, it's the process of identifying properties, properties meaning um, books, uh, ideas, plays, newspaper articles, um, a song can be an IP, you know, anything can be, it's any source of material, um, an existing script, an existing movie, a foreign film, like all those sort of things are what they call IPs, which are intellectual property. Yeah. And that becomes what they call source material. And source material is basically the foundation of which you're going to create a script or a new project, right? That could be a remake or, or an original property. So that meant going back to why I would get in early. It was like scouring the internet like learning, you know, making friends with other assistants from like from the agencies, finding out what books were buzzy, looking for, um, you know, checking who was tracking, like checking those tracking lists. Like there's lists that come out where you can find out like, what are the new books being released? You know, mm -hmm. um, learning how you get rights to the books. And so basically um, development is, you know, also knowing who those buzzy writers are. Who are the writers that are currently moving the needle, writing projects that are similar to the type of project that you're trying to create? That's one aspect of it. Um, directors, all that. And I would even be on YouTube. I'd be everywhere just looking for like who was doing short films because that also spoke to who was gonna be next. And part of being a great development executive was also being able to identify talent before they broke, right? And honestly, we worked with like several people who like went on to just do like really great things. And some of them had only one screenplay under their belt um, and are now showrunners and doing great things, you know? So that's one piece. Acquisitions is basically, so if development is basically creating something, right? It's developing a project, fleshing out a script, getting it ready for production, right? That's development acquisitions is more when you see people going to the festivals and you hear about like a film got picked up at Sundance, right? Yeah. Um, that means that it was acquired, it was licensed or purchased from that filmmaker. And sometimes they're bidding wars. 
Um, acquisitions can be at markets, and you can also do acquisitions throughout the years, but throughout the year. Um, but festivals are generally about uh, studios and, and streamers and networks picking up projects. I'm, I'm kind of. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of curious about that because we're, I mean, we're film, filmmakers. We're, there's also a lot of filmmakers that listen to the podcast. So let's say, for example, you have a feature film at a notable film festival that's gotten some kind of buzz and you specifically are interested in possibly acquiring it, how you talked about. Mm -hmm. Is that usually like, maybe kind of tell us about that process. Is it typically like you just buy the whole film? Are you licensing the film or what, how, how do you guys typically handle that? Yeah. So Usually, well, first the studios work with the eight, work with all the different festivals, right? So, um, one of one thing that we would do is probably I would say, a couple of months before the festival, I'd start putting together a tracking list, and that could mean I was on IMDb. It means I've been watching all the trades, so I kind of always knew what was going into production, and you time it out, right? And um, and then once the festivals announce who's made it into the festival, you kind of put, you start putting together your tracking list leading into you going to the, the festival, right? So by the time you get to the festival, you kind of know your your to watch list, I guess you can call it, right? Okay. Um, and based on the priorities, like it's something that you would share with like internally and you sort of think about different models that they can fit into and models are basically um, financial structures that could make sense, right? Now keep in mind acquisitions is like, it's a form of, it's buying, you know, you're basically buying the film. So, it, you know, uh, financials plays a part into the process. And that's how you see like, you know, a big film comes out of the festival, you know, for $20 million purchase or something like that. Like these like huge, um, these huge yeah. deals that come out, right? So what you'll find at the festivals is usually there'll be a lot of acquisition executives from different studios and networks that are they're basically going film to film all day. There's not a lot of parties and all that hanging out stuff going on. Literally, it's like from from like eight in the morning until sometimes midnight. You're just watching films all day. And I loved it. Like when I tell you I loved it, I, I missed going to the festivals this past year with all, you know, um, dealing with the pandemic. But you just see so much talent. Like you see so much talent. Like of course, you're going to see stuff from the established filmmakers, which is always right. you know, it's amazing, great work. But some of my favorite projects were the emerging talent because you see that passion, you see that that risk taking, you see um, you know uh, really cool POVs and risk taking in terms of like how to execute the project. Like I just love that, um, and that's one of my favorite things about it. So long story short, let's say it's a project that we want to pick up, right? Like we're like, okay, we want to pick this film up. Um, of a financial structure would come, we would put that together. We'd start working out a potential deal, a potential offer. And then you reach out to the re whoever represents the film. Um, usually it's some sort of a sales rep. I guess sales rep. Okay. Yeah, it's usually a sales rep, especially if it's already in the festival. At that point, it's, yeah, it's like nine and a half out of 10 times it's a sales rep or some sort of representative. It could be a lawyer or something like that, but usually it's a sales rep. And then you submit your offer. And then from there, you start working out terms and see if you can make a deal to pick up the project. That's nice. sort of the, the long and short from like tracking it right. to actually watching it to putting in the offer. And those offers usually happen pretty quickly. It's like they start, if it's something that's like a hot project, people will generally start bidding on it. Like right away. as soon as the film ends, the calls usually start, which is also fun. It's like, See, if you enjoy it, it's actually really fun because it's like, because now you're like bidding against other companies, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's what you hear about these bidding wars. And then, and then sometimes it takes a few days and that's not bad either. Listen, not, not every home is the right home for a project, right? I think from a filmmaker, you know, I've been on both sides of this. I've been the creative and I've also obviously been an executive. So I know sometimes when you're on the creative side, you're just like, pick it up, take my project. Like I want to, I need to find a home, right? Right. But it's like not every home is the right home. Like you want to, you want a company who's going to get your project, who's going to get behind your project, going to be a good partner for you, and going to know how to get it out into the world the right way. Like you don't want it just to come out on, on a platform or into the you know theaters and not get the love that you yeah. want for it, or that makes sense for it. 
Yeah. yeah. And if you can, if you can kind of talk about that, what it's like, what would be like a normal thing that a young, let's say a young emerging filmmaker has this one cool project, hasn't really done anything before that. What's a typical offer, I guess, for them that they might get? Rock right? bottom. Dude. Off. It honestly, it just, it really, it just depends. It's, it's really hard for me to, um, say what the offer would be because it really just depends like you have first time filmmakers who like like just like knock it out the park on their first film like i think ryan coogler's first one i believe was fruitvale station and that was yeah. like yeah that was uh yeah, that one's up there <laughs> yeah I, I wouldn't go off of first time filmmaker you know i think it just depends on the um the commercial sort of viability of the project you know and that doesn't mean it has to be like super commercial. So when I say commercial viability, I'm not necessarily saying it has to be commercial and like a big shiny, you know. But it is a business. It is a business. And that was actually one, I actually learned that first in music. That was like the first time I learned it. And I credit um, this like producer, Grammy award-winning music engineer for like teaching me that lesson. He was the first one to like really teach me how to structure something. He's like, look, if you want to make this a business, you can do it this way, but you know, and it's a formula to a certain degree, right? Mm. Um, but yeah, it's a business. It's a business. And I think that's also important as a filmmaker to ask yourself or just a, as a creator overall, regardless of where you are in your creative process, whether you're a director, producer, comedian, um, you know, writer, it's important to ask yourself on that particular project, like what's your goal? I think there's nothing wrong with, you know, just creative expression and doing something for the love of it. And sometimes you just gotta get it out and you wanna do something experimental, you know, just do something fun. Nothing wrong with that. Um, I think that if you're looking to do something to be commercially successful, well, there's, that's a different formula, you know? So, um, and I don't think that you have to lose yourself in it either. I think there's a middle ground, you know? Like, I don't think that you have to like, you know, so like, sell out. <laughs> completely. Yeah, I don't want to use sell out, but it's, it's yeah. the truth, I think I think that sometimes from an artistic standpoint, people look at like commercial as like right. selling out on your creative integrity, and it doesn't have to be. I don't think it has to be that way. I think you know you find a balance. Your voice is crucial. You know, I think it's important for you to bring all of who you are into whatever role it is that you're going to play. Like, so if you're a director, you bring all of your experiences into this. Like, I am 100% proud of the route that has gotten me to where I am today. It makes me very different than a lot of executives because I've seen things from a lot of different angles and I respect people, I respect their journeys. I'm sensitive to you know our creatives that we work with, our comedians that we work with. And it's all about being a good partner you know so i think you just you just you bring all that to the table with you it's just about learning the, but it's about learning that format so if you are doing something big and glossy and you're doing like a more commercial project you also have to learn like a there's going to probably be a lot more executives in the mix b there's probably going to be a lot more at stake from a financial standpoint so being a team player for example you might not be able to be as like you know steadfast in your particular view you have to be flexible hearing other points of views um and all with the greater good you know to getting yeah. it done and have it go out in the world and be a great project cool yeah and you said that you also looked a scoured youtube as well to find yeah. a new talent could you yeah. give an example of some somebody found or what types of content on youtube you were looking for um when i was at the feature level like when i was in the studio uh, when you were VP of acquisitions and development, so yes, okay. So you know what's interesting at that point, a lot there were um, there was a short film that I'm completely forgetting the name right now. I didn't find this. This wasn't something I would have loved to say that I could take credit for it, but I know that that was found from you. It was like basically it was a short film that they created. It was a horror, and um, and then it got picked up and I want to say was it Lights Out? I'm not sure if that went the festival route. Are you familiar with Lights Out? I think it was Lights Out. It sounds that sounds familiar for some oh, reason. But yeah, get, get Out. No, no. Lights Out. Was it about being <laughs> deaf, right? Was it about? It was no, no, no. This one, the one I'm thinking, I'm probably messing up the title, but basically there was a film that was on YouTube, and it, it might have, it might have even done like the the horror circuit, but it was a super short film. It was probably like five minutes long, and um, yeah, I'm looking at it right now. It seems like it's two minutes long. 
Yeah, it's super short, but that got adapted. Like someone picked that up. I mm. forget who, what company picked that up, but that was an example of like uh, how something that's super short can, you know, yeah, you grow legs and take off. And because really going back to what we were saying before, that's the IP. It's the source material, right? You really just need to be able to get the concept across, right? And get people excited about it. And you can do that with a short. You can absolutely do that with a short. Um, so did that two minute, two to three minute film, um, that turn into a feature or what did that get developed? Yeah, into? there's one that's a feature. That was a feature. And I feel like it was like that year, it was super successful too. I forget what hmm. the box office was on it, but that was just an example of one that I remember off the top of my head that's like super yeah. short, goes on to be super successful. I think, you know, especially if you work in the horror space, I think that's great comedy also. Those are great opportunities if you're doing a short to, you know, do a great proof of concept, whether you're calling it a short film, a short piece, a sketch. Um, but those are great to sort of translate. Just to kind of quickly touch on that and then we'll kind of move on to, to LOL. But, yeah. um, you know, what do you think? Because like, okay, a lot of people obviously pretty short. So we have a lot of people from the audience that are making content like that. And then there's sometimes they don't know what to do with it. They're like, right, I'm just going to put it on YouTube. And then it just get falls into the abyss, right? Yeah. So what do you think are some ways that um, producers and directors can get their eyes on some of those projects? Mm. I definitely feel like these days there's just a lot more options. You know, I think between YouTube, between Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, you know, social media as a whole, um, you have a lot of opportunity to give like snippets. Like you may not be able to put your whole project up there, um, but you're able to build an audience you know, you're able to build an audience that's familiar with your brand of whatever it is type of content you're creating, whether it be comedy, um, whether it be horror, drama, like you can start to sort of plant those seeds in a way that I feel like was just not as accessible. Even five years ago, three years ago, we've seen like just massive change, you know. Um, and then obviously, I always encourage folks to, you know, find your networks, um, find festivals. There's a, a ton of even just like indie festivals all over the country, obviously all over the world, but even all over the country. Um, you know, I've spoken at some, I've done some work with some like pitch fests and that sort of thing. And, you know, I've met some incredible talent who have gone on to do great things. Like, you know, so you have to find folks who are doing similar things and you build your network and eventually it leads to another opportunity if you just kind of keep going and, you know, expanding your, expanding your options. Yeah. No, that's great. Um, so it sounds like you're obviously super well-rounded based on all the different things you've done, which I think makes you a really valuable asset. Um, tell us how you ended up eventually going over to Kevin Hart's production house. Yeah. So LOL was the sister company to Code Black when we were at Lionsgate. We were both at Lionsgate. Jeff was the CEO of both. Um, you know, LOL was a, is a joint venture. It was, it was a joint venture with Lionsgate and Kevin Hart at the time it was more short form content. Um, and then obviously it sort of expanded and now we're doing a lot more. So I've known Jeff, you know, for nearly 10 years, I've worked with him for a long time and I've known Ty, who's our COO, Ty Randolph, um, and Jeff Clanagan is the CEO just to kind of add his last name in there. And um, they're just doing really exciting things, you know, right out, I left Lionsgate probably January of 2019, you know, through talking to Jeff and keeping up with him, I, I saw sort of how LOL was evolving and getting into different formats and, you know, between, you know, now we're doing longer form content. So um, if you're familiar with like Die Heart, which we produced for Quibi, that was yeah. super fun to work on. Um, that one, you know, it was a 10 by 10. So 10 minute episodes, 10, 10 minute episodes. Um, we developed it from scratch, produced it, delivered it, went out in the world and did great. Um, through our first look deal, our, our partnership with Peacock, you know, we're creating more exciting content. And that's been actually one of the best parts about it for me. You know, we, you know, we are really diversified in terms of what we're creating. So every day is a new day. You know, when you work on the feature side, it's a little slower. It's a, it's a much bigger sort of like yeah. routine, takes a lot longer. There are projects that we were working on in development when I was, uh, you know, an exec, uh, an assistant that were still in development when <laughs> I left. <laughs> so yeah. 
if you're someone who likes like movement and likes to, you know, try different things, like that's been one of my favorite parts of being with Laugh Out Loud. You know, we're in stand up. We're doing scripted, non-scripted. We have our deal with Sirius. So we've got our podcast and radio. Um, we're moving into animation. So, and just continuing to expand and diversify and, you know, and just continuing to raise the bar in terms of our production value and working with great talent. Um, you know, so that's been one of the best parts. It's just, it's a really great, it's a great time. And I mean, obviously uh, Die Hard did great, but Quibi as a whole, could you see the writing on the wall? Uh, Cause I don't think that's- Who cares? They did Quibi for the paycheck, right? Kind of like Joe <laughs> Rogan did Spotify. <laughs> well, I can't speak to any of that. I don't. I, I can't speak to that. But no, I wouldn't say that. I think you know. I think one of those things. It's like, look, in business as a whole, regardless of whatever you're doing, right? Whether you're indie, whether you're doing it with a studio, you know, you you take big swings, right? You take big swings means you're either going to hit it out the park, or sometimes things aren't going to work, and that's just the nature of the business. You know, we did Die Hard. It was a great experience. It's a great team. I still have great relationships with all the executives I worked with. They're all off doing amazing things in their current situations. And, and we're hoping to be able to create more with them in different, you know, in different ways. So it's the nature of the business. And that goes back to the relationships. You know, you maintain good relationships. You'll continue to work with them because there's going to be another thing at some point, right? There's going to be another, right. another company and, and you'll be working with the same folks. Yeah. Always build relationships because you don't know if that PA is going to be the CEO of something else one day and they're going to be yeah. like, ah, I remember that guy. He always mistreated me, <laughs> you know? So <laughs> always remember those folks. I remember folks who were not nice when I was an executive assistant. And it's so funny. Yeah. Like, I'm still, I'm still working with the, some of those same people in like different capacities or over the years I've worked with them in different capacities, but right. you know, it's just, it's just a reminder of like, you know, a be a good mentor to people right. when you have opportunity. And because once again, you're building that relationship, you know, you'll be working together with them for many years to come. And how, how involved are you if, as far as the creative process for creating this content? I mean, are the comedians coming in or is there a writing team or typically how, because there's so many shows like, yeah, I mean, I can't, I don't even know how Kevin Hart can even keep up with half of these things because he's so busy, but um, I'm, awesome. I'm kind of wondering how that goes. Yeah. Kevin is awesome. I'm not just saying that, but like I've, Felt that way before that's why i work with him now you know i love working with him honestly one of the hardest working people that i've ever worked with honestly it's, it's like if you can keep up with kevin it's, it says a lot um what i would say is it, it in terms of just the process like what's the process like in terms of editing so yeah how, how i guess how actively are you involved maybe in the writing portion of things um, um, and in the know, creative process the to get to get that kevin hart or laugh out loud touch oh gotcha okay so what I would say is, so I oversee our entire slate of um, development as well as production, right? And that's from start to finish. That's from as soon as we're gonna, as soon as we make the decision, we're gonna do something to the minutes delivered. So I'm in the mix all the way through. Um, it's about having your finger on the pulse and we're involved all the way through. Like, so for me, in terms of my particular role, that might mean and by the way, we have great members of our team too. So I'm not doing it alone. Like, you know, we have other development executives. And so we put together like lists of writers and there's different ways of doing it. So say a comedian comes in that we have, that we have a relationship with, or we want to have a relationship with, they may have an idea. This isn't, I'm just giving like an example. Sure. Um, and from there, let's just say it's something like we love, We're like we love this idea. We see how this could be, right? So my first thing is I tend to work backwards I really do kind of work from an acquisition mindset now. It's always like, I'm always thinking about sort of like, if I wouldn't buy it, we probably shouldn't make it. Like that's sort of how yeah. I think about it. Um, and then from there, you sort of back into it. So I'm like, okay, what kind of format is this? Okay, so this is a series, perfect. Okay, I'm like, okay, is this a 30 minute or an hour or like where, what kind of format? So the first part is sort of thinking about what's the format that would be best suited for this particular idea, right? And then depending on the skill set of the person or the comedian that's bringing it in, that's what we, that's where we look to sort of supplement what's needed, at least from an early development standpoint. So if they're a really great writer, um, but they could use some other folks to help them like, you know, kind of beef up the script, then we might bring, we might create a writer's room around it, right? So you mm -hmm. might option the deal, you may option the project um, and help to develop it with them, sort of surrounding them or helping to supplement with additional writers. That's one way of doing it. 
Um, or maybe they're strong enough on their own where they can create like at least enough to pitch it with or to share it with, right? So there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, there's no one way. Sometimes we'll bring in a writer and they'll write the script and that's one way of doing it. Like for Die Hard, Tripper Clancy did a great job. He was awesome. Um, Tripper came in and wrote the script, knocked it out. And it was pretty much production ready. We, we went through like a couple of passes on it, but he was great. He really got the format mm. um, and it was ready to go into production. We did a couple of tweaks and that sort of thing, but I'm always in the mix in terms of giving notes. Um, other executives on our team will also give some notes just to make sure it's fine tuned, production ready, ready to go. Nice. And I think we would be remiss if we didn't talk about your work in your empowering women over at Lionsgate. You were had a leading role there as well as other things. Can you describe your experience um, working to empower women and then let us know what the average filmmaker can do to make sure we're inclusive to everybody? Oh, I love that you're asking about this. No one ever asked me about this. So, you know, when we were at Lionsgate, that was around the time where they just started uh, to create employee run groups. Um, and so I was one of their first like co-chair. I co-chaired the women's empowerment group. And our job was to, you know, look for ways to enrich both the personal and professional experience for our female, you know, our our women, our women, our women, you know, population at the company, right? And we also did community outreach to different groups. So there so we kind of like broke it out into three, three buckets. Um, you know, I think it's really important for filmmakers who who are looking to be responsible and find other ways. It's A, there should be more women in front of the camera as well as behind the camera. It's just, it's an area that's super lacking. Behind the camera, super lacking. Like even from heading up production now, you know, we're always looking to have really great diverse crews. Um, and when I say diverse, that means perspectives, you know, ethnicity, uh, backgrounds, perspectives, all those, all those different things. So I think looking outside of maybe outside of your personal network, I think sometimes people say, well, like, hey, I'm looking for people, but if I can't find them, I kind of go back to what I know. Um, you know, I think that you, you have to create opportunities, you know, really make, make space for women in those different areas. Like that's a big, that's a big part. Um, yeah, so hopefully I'm answering that. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. It, it's always tough though, because uh, it, it's like I'm most comfortable with the people in my network, but I yeah. do recognize, which is men and women, by the way, for me, but I'm just saying like, I can understand, you know, it takes an extra step to go outside your network and, and ask around. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, there have been times before where people have met me in production. Like, you know, I've been on many sets before where, you know, you don't generally have a, an executive that looks like me on the set, right? That's like, helping to be like the lead or is the EIC, you know? So um, it's rare. It's rare when you find department heads in production and development that are women, mm -hmm. you know? And then you can sure. go further down and it's like women of color. Like it gets, it gets even like the number, the percentage goes lower and lower as you start to add, you know, hyphens. So yeah, you go outside of, you know, maybe your normal network, look in different places. Um, look at different, even when you're looking at like mentorship opportunities, looking at different schools, um, not everyone gets the same opportunities. You know, I think that's also a big part of it too, when you're looking at the pipeline of who gets the opportunities to, you know, get into the business. There's groups like um, Streetlights, I believe is one of them too, that also helps, it's a pipeline for, you know, crew members to get training and get yeah. on opportunities. And that one's been super instrumental in a lot of people's careers. My um, friends that went through Streetlights, yeah. Yeah, Streetlights is really, yeah. really great. So, you know, that's something I'd love to even, you know, at some point get involved with, you know, and we try with all of our productions to make sure that we're giving opportunities to everybody and just go through referrals, you know, reach out to different programs, all those different things. That's awesome. When I was kind of reading a little bit more about Laugh Out Loud, um, I came across an article that Kevin talked about, you know, part of the thing with the platform is he wanted to give uh, people of color an opportunity and also people that are really talented that don't get to always show their talents. Um, maybe kind of talk about that and what is sort of the mission, I guess, of Laugh Out Loud. Yeah. 
I would say comedy and color has been like a main tenant of laugh out loud, you know, um, laughter translates, you know, it, it, it transcends globally. Um, and culture, diverse culture drives culture. You know, what, what used to be considered urban is now really pop culture. Mainstream. And I, you know, it's mainstream. So, you know, we, that goes back to, again, re understanding the sensibility, reading the room. It's how you make responsible content. It's how you make content that's more reflective of, you know, a larger group of people, you know, that have been underrepresented. So, you know, we use that in making a lot of our decisions in terms of what type of content we want to create, you know, continuing to raise the bar, continuing to be more inclusive, continuing to um, find more diverse content and, and create it. Yeah. And in the last couple minutes, um, we don't want to take up all of your time because <laughs> yeah. we could be here forever. Um, you know, what are some future projects that um, LOL is doing? And um, also, are you current, currently looking for content or always looking for content? We're always looking for content. Okay. <laughs> We're always looking for, for content. Um, always looking for just really talented people, you know, just, you know, people that are creating. We love working with new comedians. That sort of goes back to the mission also. Um, of Laugh Out Loud, in addition to working with the seasoned vets, like the established legends of comedy, it's also about, you know, a big, big part of this, and it's been something very important to Kevin as well, is nurturing talent, um, what, get, you know, creating opportunities, nurturing talent, and seeing them grow, finding ways to, you know, feature them in different projects and the whole bit. So we're always looking for new content, um, and... What was the last part that you asked? Uh, what do you guys have working on? What are you working on right now that's coming up? Yeah. I know you got Cold as Balls season three. Is that the next? No, I think we're actually going on. I think we're going into like season five. Season five already? Oh, my God. I'm just, you got to catch up, off. Johnny. I'm way off yeah, then. I, think our last one was I enjoy that show. It's fun. Yeah. I know. So do I. It's a really, yeah. really fun show. Um, yeah, we also, we're expanding. We're doing a talk show that's coming up. We're moving into like talk show formats, working with different with different talent to create some talk show formats. Um, we're moving into more scripted, you know, more premium scripted content, which is more of that 30 minute format that we talked about. Um, also really doing a lot of work in the non-scripted side of things. So, you know, exploring all different types of shows in that. And everything has a comedy DNA, but it's all different types of comedy. Um, obviously, hopefully doing more stand up soon. Hope mm. getting, you know, we're-, yeah. we're Pumping at the bit to get back to the <laughs> we miss it. That's a huge part of our business. Um, and then we have the radio piece, as mentioned, and the podcast, and we're moving into animation as well. So we're busy. There's a lot of good stuff coming down the pipeline. It's a lot of stuff. But good so, stuff. It's fun yeah, stuff. that's amazing. Congratulations. Yeah. That's that's uh, that's that's awesome. Thank you. Thank um, you. Just out of pure curiosity, how much of Cold as Balls is scripted, or is that? Just Kevin Hart just going off. They probably have writers giving. I'm sure there's some kind of, or you can't, you can't say that's okay. <laughs> no, 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 like anything else, like you create, like you create like a structure of a show, but okay. yeah, Kevin is a pro. Like he's a total yeah. pro when it comes to, yeah. he has a natural, he has a natural just knack for it. Yeah. Um, he's a people person. He finds commonality. Like he'll find a commonality with someone and you know, it just goes. So yeah. Yeah. Those are not scripted interviews. Okay. Yeah. That's <laughs> great. He's there's no, right. There's no writers on the side, like coming up at breaks going, Hey, this might be funny to you have your, in any show, like even on the non-scripted stuff, like you may have like, you know, you may have a structure that you beat, like the beats that you create for the show that you want to stick to, but, okay. but they're not specific jokes. No, no, the conversations are just organic conversations and it goes where it goes. That's it why is, it's so good. It is fake yeah. ice and fake water though. No, just kidding. <laughs> fake water? <laughs> if I made a crazy face, I was like, fake water. I was like, <laughs> LOL. LOL. I can see the fake ice, but the fake water? It, it's, but... actually, it's actually real ice and real water. If you I, notice, I, the ice never melts, man. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I don't, no, yeah, I don't know. Real ice and real water. Okay. I believe it. You can definitely tell by the guests' reactions every time they jump in. Yeah, they're, everyone, they're, they're great sports. They're definitely great sports. And uh, I, guess, I guess just my final question. I don't know if you guys had a final one. Um, give us give us your best Kevin Hart story. You must know the man uh, better than anybody. And the guy's a, a hilarious guy. My best Kevin Hart story. Ooh. Yeah. Hmm. Or just the first one that comes to mind. The first one that comes to mind is actually probably around the time of like the laugh out, um, laugh at my pain, 
that whole campaign or it was around that time. So I was like, that was like early on. Actually, no, was Laugh My Pain? No, it was Let Me Explain. So this was the second mm. project I had worked on with them. Um, and we were doing some promo pieces with him. And we remember, I just remember the day was really, really hot. It was probably like a hundred degrees. And honestly, that's when I realized this guy's work ethic was like on a whole nother level. Cause first of all, we were all outside in like crazy, crazy heat. And um, the fact that he never complained and was always like, let's just go do another one. Let's go do another one. Always had a great attitude. That's when I'm like, okay, I want to work with this guy. Like this was early on. So at this point I was like probably a coordinator level. And um, you know, at this point I had worked with you know, other guests, other talent and stuff. But it was just like his enthusiasm, his passion. It's no surprise that, you know, he is who he is and where he is because it's the it's a combination of the work ethic and the positivity. But it was so it was such a wild day and it was so hot and he just kept going and I was like, this guy is great. So I like it. Yeah. It's very nice. It's great. And uh, good. I was just gonna say, I was just gonna ask final thoughts for the surviving Hollywood audience and where can our audience follow you? Ooh, well, I'm on Instagram most actively. Twitter, I don't remember my password, so don't even bother <laughs> find me there. Um, Instagram, I'm, on, I'm at Candace Wilson Cherry. And um, final words, you know, stick to it. It's been a tough past year for everybody, whether you're on the creative side or the executive side. We've all been pushed to be more creative than than you know we ever thought we could be. Um, I'm sure for actors, they probably had a really tough year where they haven't been able to work as much, but, you know, through it all, be adaptable, be flexible, ride the wave. Sometimes it's, it's tough, but you just got to keep moving. Never get stuck in the mud. Like there's going to be challenges. And someone actually told me this when I was like coming up in the business and they were like, don't get stuck in the weeds. Cause like, you know, you, you run into challenges on any production, anything you go, like anything you work on you get stuck in, in the, his whole point was like, don't get stuck in the weeds, keep it moving. Always be focused on a solution and there will be a solution and you'll find a way and you'll be better for it and more equipped. Now, if somebody slides it. into your DMs, a business inquiry, would you yeah. respond to that or, or no? So I don't take unsolicited material. Um, that's in my emails and in my DMs. So everything will have to come through a rep. Um, and even in terms of advice, it just depends on what day you catch me. <laughs> Cause sometimes it could be a lot. Like sometimes we get, you know, a lot of stuff in our, in our social media platform, you know, in our, in our DMs yeah. and stuff. So it's probably not the best way. Um, to contact to you. Yeah. yeah. It's probably not the best way. Cause it's like your personal platforms and people are reaching out, but yeah. Um, I would say it, sometimes I do like posts that are like about, you know, business related posts and things like that. And if there's something that you know that you feel like we should see i guess you could um that's actually a good point i don't know but i wouldn't slide <laughs> into the dms that's a weird that's kind of weird. yeah yeah i i wouldn't <laughs> expect you to i was just you know i'm sure everybody in our audience who had a good, cool project was getting ready to dm you so i just wanted to i would almost say this for folks who consider consider doing that because i'm sure it happens like a lot it's just not the best way to do it yeah. You know what I mean? It's just not the best way to do it. Because this is the thing. It's like, even though it may seem really tempting, like I'm sure for most folks, they're like, this is my opportunity. On Twitter, it's kind of cool because you're able to have a conversation with people. Like if you're tagging them and you're having a conversation, that's one thing. But I think if you're DMing about projects and stuff, it's really tricky. Like some people may be more receptive to like, you know, talking. But I think overall, you want to have a captive audience. So, you know, I don't know. Like just you're let more people like come to you. Let them come to you. Come to you. When, when festivals and stuff open back up, I love festivals. That's an opportunity for you to talk to people like on like on a person to person basis and like get opinion, like, you know, get, get some insight and get some FaceTime with people. And then they remember you. That's a great opportunity. I always encourage that, especially if you are an aspiring filmmaker, producer, writer, comedian, and maybe you don't come from a major city. Those are opportunities for you to meet people in the artist community and executives from that maybe have flown in, you know, and, and they come, you know, executives and producers go to the smaller festivals as well. So those yeah. are great opportunities. If, you know, if you get the, the chance to go drive to like, I think Austin has some really great ones. I've been to great ones in North Carolina. Um, obviously the bigger cities have more options, but they're out there. 
Well, we pr we produce in direct shorts. So if one day you find yourself available, we would yes. love for you to come to a festival and watch one of our projects. I would open invitation. Love that. I would love that. <laughs> you guys have to keep me posted when you're doing it. I would love that. I love shorts. Never. Just waiting to see when the world, yeah. you know, we don't really know. We have two so. in post, and we're just hoping these festivals. Congrats, have... guys! That's a big deal. That's Thank a, you. Yeah. A Thank you. Appreciate deal. that. Yeah, um, like from the financing to the, pro you know, when you're doing it yourself, that's something to be proud of. It's, there's a lot of challenges. So that's really cool. Congrats. I can't wait to see it. Appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thank you so much. Um, last thing I just want to say is uh, in the middle of research, I found that you were also married to Matthew Cherry. Yeah. And I, I saw that he wrote and directed that, that short Hair Love that won an Academy Award. Yeah. Congratulations. It was a really cool short. I, uh, the, I'd seen it before and I'm like, oh, this is so weirdly connected. And I'm like, oh, yeah. amazing. So congrats to him, by the way. Thank you for that. Yeah. And that's a perfect example, too. Like that was something that was a passion project for him while he was working another job. Like he was doing other stuff. And literally it was like nights and weekends with his team. Like they were just nights and weekends, just cranking it out after they finished like their, you know, their day jobs. Like everyone had other stuff going on. And that's a perfect, and they, they, you know, he raised the money on his own, you know, that's so awesome. it's a perfect example of like, you know, if there is not a path, like, don't be afraid to bet on yourself. Hmm. Cause that's a perfect example. Had he went and submitted that project, which I feel like at some point he probably had like was having conversations with people. Everyone's like, no, you know, it's not the right time. We're not looking for that. Right. And they built it and then people started to respond to it. So, you know, you have, it sounds so corny to say, but you really have to just believe in yourself and bet on yourself. Like, yeah. you know, for anyone thinking, why me? Why not you? Like it's, it's, that's true. It's only until you get the opportunity. If I would have just been like, well, I don't have all the experience as these other people who were submitting for, you know, the job that I won at that time. Yeah. Honestly, I, I, I still remember this one girl's resume. It was like NBC, WME, like all these things. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, I hadn't done any of this stuff before. Um, but I knew that whatever it was that they needed that I was going to outwork folks. I was going to show yeah. up. I was going to learn it. And, and I feel like it's made me better for it. Well, congrats on all your success. And I wish a lot of success as well to laugh out loud um, and look forward to seeing more content from you guys. So thank you so much, Candace, for your time. I really appreciate it. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. I can't wait to see your short. Keep me posted. Yeah, we, we definitely will. So thank you for that. Absolutely. Bye guys. Have a great weekend. Take care. Bye Candace. Bye.